All righty. Good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Joining us from coast to coast. It's been a little while since we last saw you at one of our continuing education webinar series. And we're really excited to be uh, having our next one today. It's going to be our last one before September. So we're excited to have you joining us. Uh, today's webinar is going to be titled Continu Continuity of Care with Negative Pressure Wound Therapy Strategies for Seamless Transitions. And we're joined by an amazing guest of honor and guest presenter today. Uh, you will have known her, I'm sure, as one of the past presidents uh, from, for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada. But before I introduce her, I'll go over a couple housekeeping items. So first of all, my name is Troy. I'm the Director of Operations for NSWOCC. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, joined here in Ottawa. But what I'll get everybody to do is a little icebreaker by using our chat function in the Zoom toolbar. So if you pull that up, I see that Kathy Gibson is already, uh, she already knows what's going on here. If you can type into the chat what city, town, region, province, country you're tuning in from today, it'll give us a chance to see uh, all the amazing faces and uh, people attending. Amazing people come from all across Canada. Fantastic. Okay, well, while I do that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Christine Murphy, uh, who's a registered nurse and nurse specialized in wound ostomy incontinence with uh, uh, CNA Association uh, certification in WOCC. Chris studied tissue viability with professional practice at an undergraduate level and a Master of Clinical Science and Wound Healing degree from Western University. Her doctoral research investigated the assessment and treatment of lower extremity wounds with, uh, in the vascular surgery population with focus on ultrasound debridement and wound infection. The appearance of infection specific to the vascular population associated protease activity were also explored. Professional activities include past president of NSWOCC, co-chair of the Communications Committee of the Canadian Society of Vascular Nurses, associate core faculty member and course examiner of the Master Clinical Science of Wound Healing Graduate Program at Western University, panel member of the 2013 RNAO Best Practice Guideline Update for Diabetic Foot Ulcers, a stakeholder of the current RNAO Best Practice Guideline Update for Pressure Ulcers, and is a frequent manuscript, manuscript reviewer for several peer-reviewed journals and a speaker at national conferences. And I think uh, Dr. Murphy was just at Yuma as well, so I, I know she's really well known even outside of Canada, which is fantastic. Uh, she were, currently works at, at an Ottawa area hospital with specialty in complex surgical and vascular surgery wounds, and her position incorporates the care of patients in the pre- and post-operative phase, including ostomy surgeries, surgical and trauma wounds, and limb salvage management. Additionally, Chris is an educator and mentor for health professionals interested in complex and wound management. So on, uh, without further ado, I want to thank again 3M for making this webinar possible, and I'll pass over the mic and presentation to Dr. Christine Murphy. Thank you. Well, thanks, Troy, and thanks for inviting me. And just a point of clarification, I, I don't currently see ostomy patients, but all of the rest of it is uh, right on. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you to 3M for the opportunity to present uh, this topic to you. And uh, we'll talk today about negative pressure, uh, wound therapy, and uh, continuing care uh, as patients move through the continuum. Some of this information will be familiar, and some of this uh, information hopefully will make you think a little bit more deeply about uh, how and why you are applying your VAX. So the, uh, the fine print. Okay, and uh, I am a consultant speaker for 3M. Okay, so what are we talking about when we're talking about negative pressure therapy? So, you know, we, we are all familiar with the term vac, vacuum therapy, suction therapy, and it, compo it comprises of, you know, the, uh, the dressing, so the foam dressing, uh, a suction pump with tubing and an occlusive dressing. And it's used for many different wound types, in including the acute and uh, the long-term wounds. Um, there's a uh, sub-atmospheric pressure within this uh, seal to pull on the tissue and to promote healing. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. This is very commonly used. And so how, how does this work on open wounds? So, and I'm, I'm talking about open wounds because of course we also use it on incisional wounds and so on. And I'll get into that a bit more later, but the pressure is basically pulled through the uh, wound filler, which is the foam into the cells. Uh, and then the suction tubing also facilitates the drainage of exudate from the wound and pulls in the wound edges. So as this happens, as this 
this pulling force is there, you get an altered tissue perfusion in the area. So that the tissue and perfusion is increased. And in fact, uh, you know, you can tell patients that uh, if you put the foam on the skin, they end up with what we call a vac hickey, right? You can really see the pull and the, the stress on the tissue. And uh, this, this pull also promotes granulation tissue by mitosis, by pulling that uh, those cells to their uh, extent of their expanse, they actually sort of give up and divide. And uh, the mechanisms of actions of that to promote granulation tissue have been uh, demonstrated both experimentally and clinically. And I'm sure you've seen this with your own patients when you apply this, the improved growth of granulation tissue. So what effects do you know? Well, you can remove, you can isolate the wound from um, infection, right, uh, externally. So the external um, uh, contamination of bacteria, you can uh, isolate uh, the wound from infection from um, adjacent uh, structures too. And I've seen this myself, and I'm sure some of you have where you've, uh, you've put a vac on a wound that's next to um, uh, an area that's draining maybe fecal material or something and sort of sealing it off and watching the patient physically improve as they're not dealing with such a high bio burden from, from the other source. Um, it creates a moist wound environment. We all know that the moist wound environment uh, really does help uh, with the healing, with the cells able to move and uh, get to where they need to go uh, as far as uh, remodeling the tissue. Um, again, the transmission and removal of exudate, uh, the removal of edema. Uh, so the regional edema, of course, is going to interfere with healing and it's going to decrease local perfusion just by the very bulk of it being there in the a pressure on the local capillaries that it uh, exerts. So when you can remove that uh, extracellular fluid, then the uh, microvasculature can function more appropriately. Uh, it provides mechanical stress of the wound edges, which uh, encourages them to move forward, promotes the blood perfusion, of course, and uh, it uh, promotes angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels and promoting granulation as a byproduct of that. Now, when we talk about isolation from, from infection, you can imagine these big, uh, extensive wounds, uh, it, they're easily contaminated by environmental bacteria. And so putting on that external drape um, is a physical barrier immediately. However, you know, just uh, uh, preventing bacterial entry from uh, the external environment, the wound can already be infected. There can already be enough bacteria to um, uh, develop an infection that worsens. So you do have to continue to monitor, even though that you've occluded the exterior, of course. Uh, and some bacteria may be physically removed by the suction itself. Um, whether or not that impacts the degree of infection, I don't think that's been well proven, but there, there is uh, evidence that uh, physical removal of bacteria does occur to some extent. And again, removing the uh, edema and uh, exudate, um, this really um, improves the microvascular flow. And um, you want to get uh, that out so that you get the nutrients and the oxygen within the microvasculature to the wound. Of course, if you're not getting perfusion, it's not just oxygen, but it is nutrients as well. And of course, by doing that, you reduce, uh, you know, if you have edema, you reduce the resistance to infection. So uh, if you're decreasing the microvascular flow because of edema, then the chance of infection increases. And so the surface tissue can be compressed um, with the application of the foam. And I'm sure you've seen this as the foam sucks down, there is a local pressure that that happens. And that also um, can reduce the interstitial edema, just the physical pressure. Um, and uh, of course, this is one of the reasons we like intermittent in order to uh, apply pressure that will um, move the edema. And it also can cause a little bit of a local uh, tissue pressure and even ischemia. But when you apply the intermittent suction, you're giving things a break and allowing it to reperfuse and, in fact, improve perfusion and granulation. So scientific studies have shown that there is a macro pull, so a, a bigger sort of pull uh, suction that facilitates modeling by you know, encouraging the wound to contract just by physical, um, the physical linear movement of the tissue. Uh, 
And then of course the micro deformation occurs at the interface and filament tissues. And this is important to think about when we talk about interfaces, right? When you, when you don't have that interface of filament tissue, you're going to get a slower result. This interface between foam and tissue induces these uh, biochemical reactions, such as release of growth factors and so on, and gene transcriptions that uh, instruct the tissue to rebuild. So the mechanical microstrain uh, induces this uh, tissue response, and including this mitosis that we talked about, this uh, dividing of cells in two based on the strain, which accelerates granulation, because now you've got more cell support, you've got more building bricks, if you will, uh, as the uh, the cells divide. And then of course that that pull also um, helps uh, extracellular matrix such as collagen and so on be deposited there um, by uh, improving the uh, the function of the um, fibroblasts and other uh, cells that are involved in tissue repair. So it's important to, you know, have a plan and continue through with this plan and uh, realize that all these things are happening. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you move people through out into say community providers and so on that have less capacity, say nursing homes and so on, you may feel that, oh, well, we'll just uh, use a conventional dressing um, to maybe get uh, an okay result and get them to slow a little bit, uh, to heal a bit more slowly, but to get there in the end. But unfortunately, some patients will not heal in the end without full support. So this uh, promotion of angiogenesis and granulation tissue on some of these bigger wounds, especially if they're borderline ischemic, uh, is going to be very important. It has been shown that uh, negative pressure uh, application increases granulation tissue by about 60% compared to, to controls. And when we think about those uh, sternal wounds, and uh, I'm sure many of you look after those sternal wounds, um, you're stimulating the blood flow after the internal mammary artery harvesting, which is commonly used. And of course, a common reason for the failure of those sternal incisions is that the micro or the, the local perfusion has been interrupted because of this harvesting. So you want to do everything you can do to support this. So you need to have a consistent, clear goal with the uh, team to know that uh, everybody's on the same page. Everybody understands the reason that the negative pressure is in place for the particular patient you're looking after, because what you don't want is to remove this uh, therapy and put on something else when something like a sternal wound may be at risk for an at-risk patient. So with the VAC therapy, of course, there is the sensor track, which is a pressure mo monitoring technology that maintains that steady um, suction to the uh, wound, no matter the position of the patient. And you'll see this in the machines as you know your patients move around and so on. And people may say, oh, I noticed the machine, uh, the pressure's changing. It's not reading what it should be reading. What it's doing, in fact, is reading the actual pressure. And then it, it will accommodate for that. And you'll hear the, the pump sort of move up and down to uh, make a, allowances for that, which is good because what it's doing is it's providing that consistent uh, negative pressure to the wound to allow consistent healing. It also detects things like blockages. And uh, of course, you have alarms and so on, which we all know and love, I'm sure. But it's important to know and deal with these things so the technology is still working properly. So again, uh, how it works is by improving the rate of angiogenesis, so the new microvasculature, um, endothelial proliferation. So, the, you know, it helps with the skin ingress, the integrity of the capillary basement membrane. Uh, so for the development of new tissue, capillary blood flow, capillary caliber, as we talked about by reducing edema and decreasing the interstitial edema and bacterial burden within the wounds. And so, you know, this has been uh, well known and published as you can see for some years. And you'll notice some of these references are a little older. It's because the, the very um, solid foundation has been in place for some time. And of course, you don't need to repeat things that have already been found and found and found again. So we're moving again. The, if you look at um, all kinds of different uh, areas internationally, everybody agrees on how this works. This isn't sort of one group of people. This is the expert working group for the international, in the International Wound Journal. 
for the VAT consensus document. And again, they agree it removes exudate, reduces peri wound edema, increases local mass microvascular blood flow, promotes granulation tissue, reduces complexity in the size of the wound uh, instantaneously by putting that on. Now you can manage a patient on a ward, which before might have been difficult, uh, or even in the home, and uh, prepares the wound bed uh, prior to and following surgery for things like skin grafts and uh, reduces uh, the complexity of uh, surgical uh, closure procedures. There have been many, 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 many peer-reviewed publications since 1993 when they first started coming out. And again, a lot of this research, uh, these are the, some of the original articles. Um, and really it's shown that these, um, you know, improvements, you know, the edema um, is decreased. Um, micro microvessel density increase. So you've got more um, capillary, uh, more capillaries in the area with VAC versus um, the not VAC. Um, you've got you know diabetic foot ulcers closing better and fewer amps. You've got venous leg ulcers. The RAD study is uh, actually one that uh, we looked at very intensely in our area. And uh, it really did impact our practice where they uh, use negative pressure wound therapy with installation. I'll talk a bit more about that later. It basically took old venous leg ulcers, which are horribly contaminated, a circumferential dripping venous leg ulcers, and basically cored them out in the OR and used uh, antiseptics in the in the installation and uh, decontaminated them, of course, with IV antibiotics at the same time, but decontaminated them and then were able to close them with skin grafts and uh, keep them closed uh, in long term. And this idea of taking a, a chronic um, leg ulcer thought to be, you know, sort of old and nasty and probably a maintenance wound. Um, ongoing infections and so on, and converting that into a surgical wound that could be closed um, really resonated with us. And this is part of our routine practice, this, this type of approach now. Um, topical negative pressure, you'll see in the slide TNP, that's topical negative pressure. That's sort of the UK way of referring to negative pressure wound therapy. Again, decreased bacterial counts of pseudomonas. Um, and, uh, you know, a case series showing increased fibronectin level in patients with negative pressure. So fibronectin, of course, is part of the glue that okay. holds tissue together. On the web for showing increased fibronectin level in patients with negative pressure cell. <laughs> Check it out. So you will, you heard my Siri there. That's pretty funny. She just decided to uh, jump into my lecture there, but that exactly. So fibronectin level is required. Uh, uh, fibronectin is required for the glue of our tissue. Uh, and uh, is in uh, involved in chemotaxis, so the movement of cells to where they need to be, and uh, and so on. So all of these things are induced by negative pressure therapy. And where do we use it? I mean, uh, I, I'm sure you know as well as I do. We're finding new ways every day. So sternal dehisc wounds, of course, um, diabetic foot infections, uh, post IND, uh, venous leg ulcers, open amputation, uh, residual limb support, abdominal compartment syndrome. It's life saving in this area. Um, abdominal dehiscence, orthopedic open defects, right? Plastics flap, graft support, abdominal fistula, post traumatic reconstruction, vascular wound dehiscence, bariatric surgical wound support, complex urology wounds, complex uh, pressure injury. Um, these are just some, right? So uh, again, new applications every day. You do need to know your anatomy. You do need to know what is safe and what is not safe. And you do need to have a plan with the team. And if it's a surgical wound with the surgeon to know exactly what's what, where the um, perimeters of your safe area to VAC are. Um, but um, this is highly effective uh, therapy. You do have to prepare the wound. Um, you know, uh, you don't want to put this on a layer of slough or or other sort of undebrided material. Like, you know, if you have a wound that uh, you think, oh, this would benefit from, you know, a vac therapy, but there may be in the community, maybe a, a pressure injury or something like this, which does not look terribly clean. 
you you need that wound prepared. You need to you know find your your colleagues if it's not you, and you need to get this wound prepared. Uh, in our clinic, we often use uh, ultrasound debridement to get these wounds clean to start with, or we'll use surgical debridement with our surgeons, uh, and uh, we get these wounds looking nice and clean, and then we apply the uh, the foam to nice fresh tissue for the best effect. So if you look at a wound like this, you know, I mean, this is a wound that uh, looks like it would very easily benefit from VAC. It's quite a big defect um, and it's quite, quite deep. Um, so this would be a very suitable wound for VAC. Of course, you're going to manage infection and all the other underlying disease, you know, as far as revascularization, if that's possible and so on. But given all of that has been done, now, of course, this needs to be prepared. This needs a good debridement before you're going to start, and then you can start applying your negative pressure therapy. So, you know, application technique, of course, you prepped your wound now. You want to contour the foam to the wound whenever possible. You don't just want to sort of plonk it on there and just, uh, you know, assume that it's going to fit nicely. You want to you want to contour it as well as you can for the best effect. Um, and you want to leave it relatively thick. Um, you know, it comes in, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a one inch or whatever, that kind of thickness. You know, it works by pulling the... Um, the suction or pulling the pressure through that level of um, foam. And you can feel it's kind of a, a bounce to the foam when you sort of compress it. And so that has part of how it works. So cutting it much, much thinner than that, I don't know if that's going to interfere with the way it works. Um, I would just use it as um, intended. And one of the main reasons for that is because if you cut it too thin and then when it compresses down, you actually make it rolled in edges, of course. So when you apply the uh, the foam, you're not going to squish the air out uh, as you um, as you apply the drape. Uh, it's very important when you put it on to make sure that the foam is relaxed because again, the way it works is by pulling that the air out of the foam and and pulling on the tissue as it removes the air. So if you've already removed the air, you're not going to get the same level of impact from your vac. So you want to smooth the drape across the top. And then the, the trick to get the real great seal with these things is then to smooth uh, the drape down the sides of the foam and sort of tuck it in, pinch it in at the wound edge at the bottom, and then smooth it out along the skin. And that little tuck pinch in at the bottom of the, of the sides where you've uh, smoothed it in, that is your seal right there. The seal isn't sort of wrapping it around the leg 5,000 times. Like uh, I've seen some, I'm going to blame orthopedic surgeons, but I know many different surgeons do this. They think the more the drape, the better. But actually the trick is to put the drape, smooth it across the um, relaxed foam, smooth it down the side, just pinch it in, just have a little tuck right at the, the wound edge there and then smooth it out along and uh, you will get a great seal most of the time with that. And then of course, you're gonna uh, apply the tubing through the hole and you use the you can use the paper backing on that um, trackpad as a template to cut the size of the hole. So it's a, it's a good size, it's a good toony size at least. Um, you would have to cut that hole bigger than the entire backing piece um, to make that uh, that seal not work. So don't be shy. Like get, I always say, get your money's worth of the back. Make that hole big enough. Use the template as a, a guide to how big that hole should be. And then you apply the suction. And of course, if you don't have a big enough wound to put a good trackpad flat on the top of your foam, then you can extend the area of the wound by using a hydrocolloid uh, in the peri wound um, and then just put a bigger piece of foam and make sure it's flat. If you try and put the trackpad on a foam that is not at least as big as the as the hole that you're cutting, you're going to end up with sort of U-shaped uh, trackpad when it sucks down and uh, it's going to cause alarms and it's going to cause you grief. Of course, there are different foam types. There's the black that is the basic one and this works well for the majority of wounds. There is silver that adds an antimicrobial effect, and you might want to do that on uh, infected wounds or high-risk wounds such as orthopedic hardware that are likely to get infected. 
Um, the silver one will make sort of a yellowish grayish kind of uh, wound uh, color. And uh, that can be difficult to monitor for some patients. So you have to sort of decide whether or not you want that and then realize that's what that is. And then of course, the white is the atraumatic one. And this is, you know, it's non, non adherent. Um, and uh, you er use this uh, in tunneling or near areas of concern. Um, and painful wounds, of course, but it's going to be a lot more, a lot slower result for granulation tissue because of the density of the foam. Uh, and this works well, you know, this is a, this is a patient we had a long time ago, uh, thankfully, but, um, and, and you, you look at this, and you think this is horrendous pressure injury. Actually, this person had, um, uh, they had vascular disease, central vascular disease, and they required to have a central revascularization to fix this. So this is actually an ischemic wound um, with some pressure, of course, but this is mainly uh, central ischemia. This is not uh, primarily a pressure injury, but uh, we had to obviously offload this and treat it once he's revascularized as a pressure injury. And uh, this was treated with VAC, and then it was followed by um, Prisma. Uh, to get uh, this wound uh, closed up. And uh, he, uh, he left the hospital with a, a completely closed wound. So what settings do you use? Again, intermittent is the best for granulation and perfusion. So to pull those cells and then the perfusion, they get a rebound perfusion when it's off. And this is, has been found the best if those are your goals. So you need to know your goals. Um, continuous, you would use that for wound bed stability, so uh, maybe a sternal wound or an abdominal wound, something that you want to be more stable, um, and for painful wounds, because the on-off may be uh, irritating. Of course, if you can manage the pain and they should be on um, intermittent, then that's something to think of, too. Usually 125 is the target for most, uh, usually 100 for sternal wounds. And there you use interface uh, dressing or white foam and you follow the manufacturer's directions for this. Um, you may need to adjust the suction up or down based on the response. Um, and always, again, refer to the uh, manufacturer's uh, recommendations for these settings, which may change over time and consensus documents and so on. Um, but I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with the, the basic uh, targets, which are these. So again, the intermittent mode, the dynamic mode, um, it causes sort of a massaging effect. So it uh, stimulates circulation, oxygenation, and angiogenesis, and presumably there's a lower risk of ischemic damage. So typically on our vascular patients, the majority of them are going to be on intermittent mode. The granulation tissue form, uh, formation is significantly greater in intermittent suction. Um, and again, sometimes, continuous mode is needed just because it can be difficult to maintain in uh, in uh, intermittent, so between the toes, for example. And things, again, things like sternotomies, uh, peritoneum, this kind of thing, or using um, over grafts or skin flaps, continuous mode is going to give you good structural support. And for the skin grafts that we do, we uh, do these commonly in clinic with the plastic surgeon, we will put an interface and um, that will stay on for usually seven days or so. So we would use a silver foam just so the bacteria don't grow in that foam so much. We use an interface so that the foam doesn't adhere to the new skin graft. And they're usually on antibiotics as well. So interface dressings, again, presence of the contact layer may reduce pain but um, you're gonna have no micro deformation effect and you're gonna have less granulation tissue. Uh, I tell patients it's sort of like, you know, trying to vacuum your floor at home with your vacuum cleaner and putting a sock over the hose. Really, you know, you may, will get some effect, but it's not going to be the same thing as uh, on the open tissue. Of course, some uh, structures need to be protected such as tendons, ligaments, nerves, sharp edges, bone fragments. And uh, sometimes you have to check um, to see, you know, if it's safe to apply, you can use interface, you can use white foam. Um, you, you need to uh, sort of review each individual patient. Um, you don't want the foam adhering or causing uh, any, any uh, problems with deep things like uh, 
for us, we have our vascular grafts, for example, on anastomoses. And so we have to be very careful around that to make sure there's enough coverage, safe tissue coverage, often a sartorius flap. Um, and, uh, you know, be very careful. You have to realize that uh, patients can run trouble if you're a bit too aggressive with the wrong type of patient, especially in, when you have infection, which of course rots tissue. We always presume that wounds heal and they're getting better, but actually if they get worse, you have to think about if I take this vac off next time and it's actually worse because there's an infection, are we still okay? Are we still safe? So some pearls, interface dressings add comfort, but reduce effect. And, uh, you know, you can you give people pain medication to, to deal with comfort. And often patients, if they are aware of this, they would rather get a fast result than, and manage their pain than not to deal with this. So, it, you know, patients should be involved in this decision. The best granulation response is direct exposure to foam cells. Solid dressings are not suitable under foam. And I think we all know this, but you do see the odd person writing silver cell instead of silver foam. And uh, I have seen it happen once a very long time ago where somebody did put silver cell under a foam and it required an OR to debride it off. It really does uh, adhere well under vac. Um, it does not prevent infection. So you have to keep your assessments going. The foam uh, is cut to conform with tissue and not compressed. So contraindications from the FDA, so that you're aware that these are some formal contraindications. A necrotic tissue with eschar, so it's not it's not going to work with that, and it's going to um, cause uh, bacteria growth. Um, it's going to be a beautiful area for bacterial growth under that. Non-enteric and unexplored fistulas, where malignancy is present because it makes tissue grow, it's going to make malignant tissue grow. Uh, in wounds with exposed vasculature, anastomotic sites, exposed nerves, exposed organs, untreated osteomyelitis. Treated osteomyelitis is okay, and we do this all the time. So, of course, we need expertise. We need people that know what they're doing. That's why NSWOCs are typically involved in the team uh, to ask the questions about whether things are safe. Um, during a four-year period, negative pressure therapy caused one, 174 injuries and 12 deaths. Um, nine of which were related to bleeding in the U.S. alone. So you need to, you know, it doesn't happen often, but you, you need to know what's what. And this is a good reason for you being there to oversee that uh, these things are put on safely. So bleeding of exposed vessel grafts during um, negative pressure wound therapy due to, for example, graft-related infections continues to be the most serious adverse effect, event. So graft-related um, infections. So we're talking vascular type grafts here. Uh, of course, when those prosthetic grafts start to get infected and then things rot, as I was saying, the anastomosis can break down and you can have um, a serious bleed very quickly. So we are very careful to make sure that everybody is aware that there is sufficient coverage and that infections are aggressively and proactively treated when we have prosthetic grafts. Of course, incisional back therapy is becoming quite a thing now, and I'm sure many of you have seen things like Pravina out there. There are very different, there are very clear difference. We're not pulling on tissue anymore. The idea of the uh, incisional vac is that there's a reduction of the lateral tension, so there's less likely for the incision to pull apart, and there's um, support for um, hematoma and seroma uh, reduction, and actually the pressure on there can reduce the likelihood of them even occurring. And of course, reduction of tissue edema means that you're going to get faster incisional healing. And of course, this is disposable. It's for incisions. Uh, it can be used on patients at risk for surgical site infection. We use this a lot in our uh, vascular department. Um, it's for compromised patients who are, you know, ha going to have uh, difficulty healing. Um, sometimes uh, it's for bariatric patients that maybe have stress on their incision. Uh, it can help support that. It's usually applied in the OR, and they may be sent home with it. It's usually on for several days. And again, a Cochrane review in 2020, there is moderate certainty evidence that negative pressure wound therapy results probably results in fewer surgical site infections than treatment with standard dressings after surgery. And if you know Cochrane, they're, they're slow to make positive statements. So uh, that's, that's very encouraging. Now, installation. 
I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the uh, the Veriflow. Again, this can be used with um, various different solutions. Um, and the idea here is it's it's a soak and then removal. So if you think of the way VAC works, pulling on the tissue and so on, and we said, you know, you need to really have a good baseline, um, good wound to work on. So it's nicely debrided, it's nice and fresh, but they don't stay that way as we all know, right? So what happens is that there's exudate and there's, um, there's waste material. So all cells produce waste um, and this builds up in the area. So the idea of soaking with either saline or some other solution, the idea is to solubilize some of those waste products and some of the slough buildup and so on, and then rinse it out. And by doing this, you're rebalancing the wound environment. You're taking away the, the waste products and uh, the slough and the bacteria and those kinds of things that may be on the surface. And, and by doing that, those things all will alter um, the, the pH to an area where bacteria preferentially will grow. So obviously a, a nastier environment is going to be one where bacteria are gonna to wanna to grow and uh, they're going, it's going to slow down your healing. So the idea here is that you're cleaning out sort of all of the garbage and you're refreshing the wound surface by soaking, typically about every three, three and a half hours and only for 10 or 15 minutes is necessary typically. And by doing that, you have so much better uh, environment for these cells to move forward and uh, and regrow. And so we're finding, you know, they are finding uh, better results with this. So saline is actually pretty good for the majority of wounds. It, it, it does the job. You're, you're just sort of rinsing things through and you're, it, this is different than a, than a flow system. The idea is that things have to soak and solubilize and then you resume the VAC therapy. Um, other solutions that are used, things like Prontosan, VASH, Dakin solution, iodine, ringers, lactate, these kind of solutions have been used. And again, you follow the local guidelines and manufacturer recommendations for these uh, solutions. So I'm rebalancing the wound to get the better uh, result. You can see this wound uh, needs some work. The, there's no amount of VAC therapy is going to fix this wound without a little bit more attention first. You need to address things like necrosis. You need to address things like senescent cells, damaged extracellular matrix that may be in the wound, in situ biofilms, of course, if your edge is not migrating the chronicity of the wound, the inflammatory response and where that's at and the infection. So these are th targets for uh, to be addressed. And, you know, here's an example of a, a vascular traumatic wound where somebody was um, hit by a bus and um, degloved and ended up needing a, um, a bypass through there. And originally when uh, this patient uh, was seen, they were felt to need an amputation, um, a higher amputation. And it was thought by um, one of the, the teams that maybe there was no point in really doing much of anything with the wounds, but uh, it, it was worth applying that to, to see what would happen. And the, the concern here was that there was a, a vascular graft um, in there uh, after the injury. And of course, if you do a VAC circumferentially, it's not ideal because you can compress down on the blood vessels in the limb. And so the concern was, well, can we do this? But of course, if the leg is going anyway, if the idea is they're going to have a very high amputation anyway, then what have you got to lose, right? So it was a team decision to, um, to VAC this. And as you can see, they did extremely well and were able to use the leg later. Um, so this is what um, a cleanse choice of dressing looks like. So Veriflow, the idea of Veriflow is the soaking, as I've mentioned. Um, and with the Veriflow cleanse choice dressing, you see there's this um, dressing with the holes in it. And this is, this is a pretty cool dressing in that as you soak and solubilize the um, slough and other stuff that's in the wound, and then you turn the, the suction back on, the slough and all of the debris goes up through the holes because there's less resistance there. And then you get the granulation in the area that there's not holes. And it's basically this, this debrides for you. 
So within a few dressing changes, you'll find that the sloth has been physically removed. So there's a mechanical movement of the wound surface, uh, cyclical dwell time, just like the, the original Veriflow, the solubilization of the wound debris. And then they're disrupted in the wound bed and pulled out. And then this can prepare for primary or secondary wound closure. It's pretty comfortable. And Tia in 2017 published a, a few cases on this. And you can see that, you know, shown at day zero and day nine, these three wounds look so much better. And if you look at that third one, I mean, how impressive is that, right? So what it, it doesn't take very long. So usually people are on this therapy. In our practice, when we've used this, it's been two weeks. Uh, we, we don't go longer than two weeks and they can go back to regular negative pressure therapy because the wound is cleaned up that much. So uh, it's, it's quite stunning in some of these wounds. And so uh, he looked at 21 patients um, and 21 complex wounds, used the Veriflow Cleanse Choice, uh, soak time 10 minutes and uh, phase time three point. So every three and a half hours, there was a 10 minute soak at 125 uh, suction and the dressings were changed for every three days to get this response. And uh, so he compared conventional negative pressure to Veriflow. And uh, of course, uh, patients received surgical debridement, but some did not. And uh, some patients had confirmed uh, and treated osteomyelitis. So the duration was on average 8.7 days, so not even two weeks. And usually in that time, they had 2.9 dressing changes. Most of the non-viable tissue was removed at the first dressing change after three days of therapy. So it's very quick. Uh, an average of one to three applications, rapid uh, granulation tissue, no, you know, no matter whether they're debrided before or not, they didn't need to be debrided before or not. That, that's the point, right? Um, less than 10% was sloughy and rapid decrease in necrotic tissue. So if you don't have the ability to debride, this is good. So when you discontinue negative pressure therapy, this is the next question. When you've, got a, when you've met your goal, so you've got a granulated wound, typically a superficial depth. Uh, if you've got a skin graft, then one week after that. If there's a plan for a skin graft, you need to know it. You need to keep it going until then. Drainage is under control, structurally sound, ready for surgical closure, if that's the goal suitable for conventional dressings. So here you have, uh, there's a vascular graft uh, under all of this. So what preparation do you need? Well, this needs to be debrided out and uh, likely there needs to be a sartorius flap put in there or some kind of protection. Uh, we need to make sure there's enough tissue between the graft and the uh, vac application to make this a safe thing to do. Where is the anastomosis? So you have to talk to the surgeon. It's not something you can go in and assess yourself. You need to talk to the surgeon about this. And uh, does, does negative pressure therapy work? I think probably most in the audience know it does. And this is your typical sort of diabetic uh, neuroschemic type patient who's also on chemotherapy. <laughs> so, you know, um, not an easy patient and, uh, you know, just within a few days, we're able to take this wound that is very close to joint down to something relatively superficial. And here's another one which may look uh, pretty benign, but actually there's tendon in that first uh, shot, right? So um, the fact that there's tendon there and we were able to get that to cover, that can be a very challenging thing to do. He had multiple uh, vascular uh, bypasses and redos, a smoker and so on, but we still managed to get this closed. And again, you know, this, this can take some time, but uh, he did pretty well. So I'm going to say consider the complete plant uh, healing. We often do skin grafts, as I said. In picture one, you'll see there's a skin graft uh, ready to roll in clinic. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to put the um, uh, interface and the um, vac on that. Um, usually silver back for around a week without an undisturbed. And then the second one, we have a biological where we've covered for somebody with an extensive wound. Um, and again, this is very well supported with um, the VAC. We would fenestrate that as we would the skin grafts to allow um, the exudate, the seroma or the hematoma to be uh, removed, which is a common cause of failure for these things. 
and to allow that to have good um, contact with the underlying tissue to support healing for a difficult patient. So we need to know what the full plan is before we can decide to take these things off. And with that, I'm going to um, invite questions. I hope that triggered some uh, some sort of thought and uh, makes you realize how important it is that you um, have the knowledge that you have and that you are there. It's not something that uh, the average wound nurse or the average surgical nurse, the average medicine nurse or home care nurse would know who's not an ends walk would not understand probably all of the intricacies that are involved in uh, applying back therapy. And it's this is the reason we're here. And uh, I congratulate you for being there for our patients and I invite questions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. First of all, that was fantastic. And thank you for taking us through the multiple cases as well. We do definitely have some questions here. So I think I might uh, start with one a little bit earlier on. And I think this was uh, when you were talking about a dynamic uh, versus intermittent uh, negative pressure uh, wound therapy there. Now, Michelle was asking, is there a best setting for intermittent negative pressure or for how many minutes at what setting uh, on and off? Sorry, on on for how many minutes at what setting and then off for how many minutes? Is what so, yes, it's, it's pretty much always five minutes on and two minutes off. And that's that's been what they've always done. And I, honestly, I'm not sure it, it befuddles me why they uh, why they have that setting on the machine that you can select or why it's not buried a little bit more deeply and just programmed for five on two off, because this is. The most common question I get from uh, residents who come through is that they order they order continuous because they don't know how many minutes to order on and off for the intermittent. So uh, why there's an option, I don't know, but uh, five on and two off. Perfect. Thank you. And now going back to some of your cases there, I think we had a question. I believe this was just before or just at case one. Uh, they were asking about, can the foam run over the bare skin or draping skin first? uh is the best practice uh when bri bridging two wounds yeah so the foam cannot touch uh skin uh open skin it will cause as we say the vac hickey at first and then the next thing you know it's denuded it's gone within uh, you know and then you've ended up with a bigger wound so there always needs to be some protection uh, i know the company do say that you can use their drape around some wounds and that can be protection and of course there are things like the cavalon that you can use um, and it depends on your wounds. So uh, again, I deal with a vascular population and they uh, have tend to have ischemic uh, skin and they need a lot of protection. So we always find the best, well, we always use um, the Cavalon and a hydrocolloid. Uh, the Cavalon to make a seal in the hydrocolloid um, to make sure that uh, if the foam moves to protect the skin, um, if you just put the hydrocolloid on, you're going to get maceration on its own. If you just put the cavil on, it's not enough protection for our, um, our vascular wounds. So if you have compromised patients, that is a good way to protect the peri wound skin. Um, but uh, you do need protection of some sort, yes. Fantastic. And, and another question that I see we have sort of a couple in the chat here. Uh, one person was asking whether it's okay to use anodyne on the wound bed instead, instead of adaptic, then foam. So I would say that um, that has not been um, an indication from the company that I'm aware of. And so when you think about putting something else under the suction, uh, you don't know uh, what kind of dose you're getting into the tissue, right? So it could be because of the pressure and it's sealed in, you don't know if you're getting some kind of iodine dose into the wound. Um, maybe you are, maybe you're not, who knows? But uh, if it's not, um, it's not Health Canada approved for that use, uh, you're sort of on your own with that. So I, I cannot recommend that you do that. Um, and I would be concerned that uh, until the studies have been done, um, that you would be sort of out on a limb doing that. Fair enough. And, and another person was asking about whether when they have a client who has pain uh, or experiencing pain with negative pressure wound therapy, can they use adaptive as a non-adherent layer? Yeah, so you can use uh, non-adherent layers for pain, of course, um, but uh, this comes back to the question of the interface of the tissue with the foam is the ideal situation. So uh, given that there's no deep structures, that's what you want to be aiming for. So you are actually better to manage their pain with uh, pain medication for a short period of time to get that granulation going and, and let it be a shorter period of VAC than you are to put on an interface 
and, and let it be a lengthier period of VAC. And at the end of the day, if a patient's on the VAC a couple of weeks longer for a painful wound, even with an interface, you might have done them better service by giving them pain medication and then they're not on the VAC for as long. So you have to kind of discuss this with the patient, their own goals of care and uh, what, what it is they want to do. Fair enough. Well, thank you for touching on that. And uh, another attendee was asking us here, um, how or when would you decide uh, to change the dressings when using negative pressure wound therapy? So typically it's three times a week. Um, it depends though, if your a skin graft will be five to seven days, you leave it on. Uh, typically um, the Veriflow, sometimes that's twice a week. Uh, because it's being cleaned all the time, but it, but it depends. Again, you go back to manufacturer directions and uh, you don't want to leave it on longer. So a, a routine, regular vac needs to be done three times a week, because if you start leaving it on longer than that, you're, you're going to notice the smell and there's going to be an in increased chance of infection. So you have, you know, when we put it on for five or seven days for the skin grafts, we have antibiotic coverage. So it should be done as, as directed, which is baseline would be three times a week. Thank you. And we have a couple questions here and talking about hydrocolates here. Uh, Ludwig's asking here, can you use the plastic drape instead of the hy hydrocolate on the track to, pr to protect the healthy skin? And I, again, that comes back to your patient, right? So in some patients that may wor work. So if they're young, healthy patients, orthopedic patients, maybe, um, and that that's comfortable for them, you might get away with doing that. Um, I still would, I think I would still think about putting a cavalon underneath there because when you pull it off you're going to be pulling a layer of cavalon rather than you know pulling on their their skin quite as much um so i think that might just get to be a bit tender after a bit but uh again for our vascular patients because uh they're so um susceptible to any kind of pressure the hydrocolloids necessary so that you don't get the skin damage at the end so at the edge so you'll know your patient, try it and see if it looks okay. If it looks a little strange, then I would go with the hydrocolloid. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Bethany, for uh, posting this again. I'm sorry I missed your comment earlier there. Uh, if there's no exudate in the VAC canister, should the VAC be discontinued? So no, and I hope I hope uh, that's uh, uh, that's been clear after uh, the presentation. The VAC does so much more than remove exudate, right? So it's pulling on the cells, it's, uh, it's, it's physically changing the uh, direction of the cellular movement. So pulling in the skin cells from the edge, it's causing mitosis, which is improving granulation. So uh, in our vascular patients, it's very common for them to have next to no drainage. And uh, in the early days, we really had to do some local education to our community nurses saying it's not an exudate management tool. That suction is causing them to have better perfusion and allowing them to heal a wound that we couldn't heal with regular dressings. Perfect. Well, thank you for touching on that. And and here's a, a more specific uh, question, maybe a specific case. Uh, this person talked about uh, there's potentially a case where there's bleeding when the foam is taken off, even prior to uh, soaking. Have you done anything or you have experienced any situations where you've had to troubleshoot granulation tissue that's embedded into the foam? Yeah, so that can happen. So there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things that are at play there, right? So why is it bleeding? So is it because they're heavily anticoagulated or is it because it, the tissue is growing into the foam? And if the tissue is growing into the foam and you remove it and there's a little bit of pinpoint bleeding, that's actually a good thing um, in some wounds because you're, you're stimulate when you get bleeding, you're releasing new growth factors that are instructing the tissue to move forward. So that's why well, one of the reasons we debride. So it depends on the reason for the bleeding. If it's a vascular groin that's bleeding, I'm not terribly happy about that because I don't know where it's coming from. But, uh, you know, it depends. It very much depends on the wound. Soaking things off and figuring out why it's bleeding. So is it bleeding again because they're heavily anticoagulated? Is it bleeding because there's a biofilm uh, infection basically there that is causing the tissue to be friable? And has that been properly managed? So there is yeah, more assessment, unfortunately. No problem. Well, thank you for touching on that. And another person was asking about the use of hydrofera blue with negative pressure wound therapy. Is this something that you've seen before? 
So again, this is going to be um, this is going to be like the uh, other question in that I'm not aware that Health Canada has approved the use of hydrofera blue or any other uh, associated dressing under the system. The system is designed to be used as as a system of its own, and um, anytime you do that going off label, you can be kind of responsible for what's happening with that gentian violet, that methylene blue being soaked into that wound over a few days under pressure. Um, could there be any um, sequela to that? And, and I, I would be concerned about doing that. I wouldn't do that personally. Thank you. And just a, Bethany asks a follow-up question here, whether anti-coat, uh, sorry, Actacoat Flex is the best use if black foam is sticking to the wound. If it's the best use? Uh, yeah, whether it would be the best use or let's say that the black foam is sticking to the wound, how would you potentially approach that situation? So again, minor sticking to the wound is not a problem. Um, so as long as there's not a, a lot of pain, uh, because that's what it's supposed to do. There's supposed to be interface between foam and cells. So that's not that's not a, a, in itself a problem. We don't want to stop that happening unless it's again causing a lot of pain, a lot of ingrowth. In which case, if there's a lot of ingrowth, then you've got to think about why is it sort of hypergranulating under there? Again, is there biofilm and so on? Uh, you can use the interface again it depends on the type of wound so it's you know different wounds uh, respond differently in different areas of the body and different patient populations and so on but again acticoat flex uh, i think that was mentioned is, is i'm not aware that health counter have approved the use for that under a negative pressure therapy okay no problem and it looks like we uh, have a couple more questions coming in here i'm just seeing the time we have a time for a couple more so we'll see if we can get through these here um, Christina asks, how can you decrease the risk of placing a negative pressure wound therapy on a near circumferal wound to get the benefit of the therapy? How can you decrease so, the risk? So yeah, it's almost yeah. circumferential. So yeah, and again, it depends. It depends on your goals of care. So that that uh, trauma patient I showed, that patient was going to lose their leg if they didn't have a granulation and skin grafting. So it's a risk versus benefit type thing. Um, it depends, right? It's if they're a severe vascular patient or they're not and so on, make sure that they're comfortable. Um, sometimes it has to be applied so circumferentially. There are patients that this does happen and you just have to make sure you're you're checking that their pain level is not bad, that their circulation to their foot, if that's what we're talking about, is okay. So you're doing your pulse checks and your color checks and all of that kind of stuff. And, and and just watch very carefully. You might have to change it more often um, if that's, you know, you might not leave it from a Friday to a Monday. If you're concerned about that, you might want to give them a break. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes you you don't have an option. It's a risk versus benefit. Again, in, in consultation with the team and the patient. And uh, a question, I, I see if I can, I can put this in a way that's easy enough to re respond more generally. So um, in a situation where the hole in the track pad is bigger than the wound, do you mind just giving maybe some a couple tips or maybe just a quick summary of what you already went over about using hydrocolloid to extend the surface of the wound? Yeah, so um, so uh, usually we would picture frame the, when we're applying the vac, we picture frame the uh, wound with uh, either the drape or a hydrocolloid, usually with Kavalon, that's what I usually would do. Um, so that's, that's normal. So it's about a one centimeter, um, picture frame. I think most people will be familiar with that. Um, so what I'm talking about extending that is rather than just making that the one centimeter picture frame, you actually put a, a big piece of hydrocolloid, uh, of one side of the wound or however it sort of lies. And then you can put the foam on top of that. You put a bigger piece of foam on that covers the wound and also covers, goes on to that uh, adjacent um, hydrocolloid. So nothing's touching the skin. You just got a bigger platform to put that on. Fantastic. And we have a question from uh, Christina in our Q&A here, uh, asking about what the correct way to moisten the foam is prior to removal. Is it removing the drape and pour normal saline to moisten it or introduce the saline through the actual tubing while leaving the drape closed? Yeah, so I think, again, it depends on the patient again. So uh, my preference is to usually, for most, I would I would peel it off and uh, moisten it as necessary as I peel it off from the side. 
Um, you can put uh, saline uh, down the tube to remove it. That, that does work. Um, you know, it depends, again, it depends how mucky that tube looks and so on. If, if you think that there may be bacteria in that tube that you're then pushing back into the wound that has been there since Friday, if you're taking it off on a Monday, um, again, it's, it's, it's your judgment. There's, it's not wrong to do that. And certain wounds, it's easier to do that. Uh, but um, typically, I'll, I'll just uh, put it in from the side. That's my preference for most patients. Fantastic. I think we'll end off with this one last question here because I think we're right up at, at time. Uh, Ludwig is asking, how long should I wait to decompress the vac to avoid too much pain on my patient when changing the foam? Would you recommend soaking it with sterile water or normal saline? I think we were mentioning that earlier. So to decompress, I mean, basically you're switching the, the suction off and it's decompressing on its own very quickly. That shouldn't cause most patients pain. If patients are having an awful lot of pain, you've got to look to the reason why they're having pain and deal with that because it really, the it therapy shouldn't be that uncomfortable if the, if the wound is well managed and not infected. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to echo what Shirley McSaveny is saying in the chat here. Very informative and interesting. Thank you so much. And I'm sure uh, that goes without saying from uh, everybody from across Canada, we really appreciate uh, both you and 3M for making this possible today. It's a very interesting and very informative uh, webinar. And for everyone who's online, if you have colleagues or if you want to watch this again later, it will be available as a recording on our nswoc.ca website. And uh, those who are in attendance with us today will be receiving a certificate of attendance from NSWOC. So do check out your email by the end of the week. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Murphy. We appreciate your time and your expertise as always. And thank you again, 3M. We hope you all have a good rest of the evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye.